Jordan Candlish is a men's coach, content creator, and entrepreneur. He is the founder of State Shifters, a brand dedicated to helping busy people get out of their heads and into their hearts. Jordan has coached thousands to improve their lives and relationship, and his content has been seen by millions. And exciting news, Jordan is hosting an attraction and intimacy relationship workshop on June 15th. And despite that coming up, he's made time to join us on the Coupley Relationship Advice Podcast today. Jordan, what is happening? My man, what a beautiful introduction. Thank you, bro. Thanks for the plug as well. Uh, man, it's, it's great to be here. It's great to be here. I'm really looking forward to this conversation with you. Finishing the, the Friday, finishing the week strong. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun, man. Let's get after it. I'm excited to have you here. Jordan, for the people, if they haven't seen you yet, and we're going to have all the links below. So if you're watching this and you're seeing Jordan, you're already like, this is a cool guy. Scroll down to the show notes, give him a follow. Check out all his links. But Jordan, for those that haven't met you or seen your content yet, would you mind telling the couple audience how you got into this space? Yeah, I mean, I feel like all of us, you know, we're on this constant evolution and things are changing always. And I'm just constantly shifting how I'm showing up in the world just by following where my soul is taking me. And I got into this space through realizing that the path I had chosen to walk um, when I was 20, 21, uh, being, I went down the corporate route. I studied business, finance, and accounting, became a corporate tax accountant. And I recognized or realized that the path was completely out of alignment with what my soul was here for, like my purpose, my real reason for being. And it propelled me onto a journey of just trying to discover myself. Like many of us that step into the personal development space, it comes out of pain. It comes out of something's not right. I'm, I want to figure out who I am and what I'm here to express. And yeah, man, I went on a, a spark the journey and I've been really on that path now for the last eight or nine years. And it took me out to Canada. I lived in Toronto where you are right now. And uh, I, throughout that whole period, bro, I was with my partner. I met my partner when I was 21. And I'm 29 now. And throughout that whole personal development journey, she's been with me. You know, we've been together. So I've evolved, we've evolved. And it's just this, yeah, this constant evolution that is now just showing up online. I started making content about seven years ago when I started this, this journey as well to kind of document what I was learning and share with other people and ho hopefully inspire other people along on, on their process as well. So that's the, that's the short end of it, brother. You know, it's interesting because I think the video of yours that I saw that I so resonated with, it was like um, unhealthy ways that, that high performers deal with stress. And I watched it and it was like, it was like you were talking directly, directly to me. Like it was a, it was a one-to-one -one where I was like, oh, wow, these are literally all the things I do. It was like, lose yourself in video games. Uh, go out and get absolutely <laughs> battered. You know, you know, uh, just just grind and work completely late into the evening. Uh, drink, get yourself fired up by drinking lots of coffee. And I was like, wow, it's 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 like he, this this is a guy that obviously has been there and 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 knows it. And I really did feel like you were talking directly to me, which is very very cool. That's why I gave you a follow. Um, and then I just was very very interesting how I saw then as I as I looked into you a little bit more, I was like, oh wow. Jordan and I actually been on like somewhat of a similar journey, both moved to Toronto in the same year. We're both out in Tulum at the same time. Mm. If only I'd have just hit you up a few months before, we could have probably done this in person, which would have been awesome. But it made me think as you spoke there, your partner's actually seen you really change. You, you were a corporate lad and, mm. and, and now you're an entrepreneur. But in the mindfulness space, in the wellness space, in the relationship space, it's a very, very different Jordan. How have you guys navigated these changes together? Hmm. Well, firstly, man, thank you for following along on the content. And uh, I'm sure the listeners always appreciate your honesty and transparency. And I really felt that with you when we first met. And uh, it's the reason I make the content is because it's, it's something I've been through. It's something I've gone through. Uh, so, you know, there's there's resonance, you know, it's when you, when you put that content out, it, it tends to attract people who are on a similar path, which is what I love about social media. Uh, the <clears throat> path of 
my relationship and, and us changing so much. It's, it was such a interesting opportunity, man, because we started our relationship doing long distance. I was living in Australia. She was living in Canada. So we had seven months where we weren't in each other's presence. And I remember calling her up going, Hey babe, this is fucking, this ain't the thing, man. This corporate job, I just, it's not, it's not for me. I had the dark night of the soul, those real dark periods. And I remember just coming home in the evenings and we would chat. She was starting her day as I was ending my day. And she heard all the struggles. She was with me through all the, the confusion and the doubts. And when she eventually came out to Australia, uh, there was, the, the next layer of our evolution began because we got to be and support each other in person, not just through communication. And that's the first layer or foundation that I believe is essential for success in any relationship is communication. So once we had that solid foundation, it was then about, okay, now how do we now navigate this, these change, this changing landscape internally, but then also externally, because in 2017, I decided to quit my corporate job and decided to fly out to Canada and roll the dice and be like, you know what, fuck it. I'm going to go out there, no plan. And I ended up living with her family for a, a year, a full year you know, with her family. And uh, yeah, obviously brought up a lot of challenges and opportunities, but beautiful memories and, and, and growth as well. And what ended up happening, Tim, was we didn't create this elusive plan in our heads that we needed to get married at this date and our relationship needed to look like this. It, we just took each step as it came and each challenge as it arose. And the more and the more we kept walking the path, the more we realized that, hey, we're just a, a really beautiful match. It is, this is just working. So let's just keep going. And I find that a lot of people in relationships tend to project too far into the future instead of just focusing on what, what's going on now. Do you work now? Are you feeling attraction now? Cool, keep going. Don't overthink it. And that's just, that's just what unfolded for us, man. Um, <laughs> just been a natural evolution good for you guys i love to hear that there's often this relationship challenge with folks that start off if you meet when you both live in different countries you have to go through an ldr and then you have to eventually have some kind of plan to get on the same get in, get in the same country get in the same place get in the same city but it often goes from that zero to 100 where you go from in your case, living in two different continents on the opposite side of the planet to moving in with the in-laws. How did you manage some of that? Were there any obstacles or things that you had to sort of challenges that you had to overcome? Because it's, 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 quite, it's quite tough. Initially, there's like a little thrilling mm. period where you're like, oh my God, we're finally together. And then you're like, Oh God, I'm, I'm sort of a guest in the in-laws house. How did you, how did you work through those bumps in the road? Yeah. Thanks for asking, man. I haven't really spoken about this openly with, with people online because it's just not something that a lot of people know, but it was the most, the most growth. And there was so much growth that happened during that time because, uh, here I was 23 or 24 quit my job, uh, <laughs> trying to discover who I was in my path in life. Mm -hmm. And, I was living with my, my girlfriend's family. And in the back of my mind, I was like, I have, a, I have enough savings to get me through the next few months, but at some point I have to go out and get a job. I can't just live with her, her folks for too long. And I remember initially, Amanda, my partner told me that her dad initially didn't want me staying in the same bed, same room as her. And, and I didn't even know. So I just showed up like, hey, what's going on? Nice to meet you. And well, I'd met them before, but like, hey, what, what's up? Yeah. Like, thanks for having me and stuff like that. Yeah. And I'll, I can I'll understand that. Back to my room. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can understand that, bro. Imagine, you know, you have a daughter and this fucking random Australian lad just rocks up at your house. I'd, I'd be like, no fucking way. <laughs> go, get those, go downstairs. You know, so I, I, the beautiful part about this, bro, was I have such a strong relationship with my girlfriend's family because I got to know who they are. They, they welcomed me in with open arms and... I, I'm like best friends with all of her family. And to me, that is one of the greatest blessings that I wish all people to have within their relationship. Uh, and I mean, that brings up challenges around me learning how to set boundaries and, and finding my own space. But for that period of my life, bro, it was a beautiful gift because it allowed me to have the foundation to really go after a life that was more aligned with my heart. So it was a special time, important time. That's awesome. And I guess we're talking, 
some of the things that I want to talk to you about are the polarities that we see in relationship. Can you talk about some of the polarities that you see come up in the people that you coach, people that you connect with, and what are the impacts that these polarities can have? Mm -hmm. Well, firstly, it's, it's about understanding what is polarity. And polarity is, is the, the magnetic charge. It's the attraction. It's the spark. It's, it's the poles, the positive and the negative, right? And on, a, on the surface layer, we can see man, woman, positive, negative. But if you go deeper, there's all these other intricate polarities that are happening because a man can be more in his, like for me, for example, if you look at my astrological chart, I have a lot of earth in my, in my chart, which is feminine. So even though I'm masculine, I'm a man, there's still a lot of feminine qualities about me. So who I attracted as a partner had to create an offset that allowed for polarity to be there. So my, my partner has a lot of masculine qualities in how she shows up, very like driven and action orientated and decisive. And, you know, I'm more of a slow feeler connector and understanding that is really helpful because you'll know straight away when there's attraction with someone. Right, when there's the spark is there and the polarity is there, you're just magnetized towards them. But it's more as you go deeper into the relationship. Right? What happens is, is sometimes the attraction starts to fade because we lose our natural tendency to stay in alignment with, with our essence, our nature, right? which, like I said, could be more masculine, could be more feminine. There's a, there's a, mm -hmm. there's a, there's a skew, there's a pendulum. It's not always going to be one thing. And what... I see is like the more people can understand, okay, how do I stay within my natural tendencies, my natural proclivity? And as a man, that always arises through you just being present, through you being grounded and anchored in, in your, your, your being. And then you return to your natural pol polar system, whatever that looks like. And then the relationship can then evolve from that place. But without that awareness, what happens is men get pulled up to our, into their heads. They lose sight or connection with, with their grounding, with their center. And then they're not able to create that charge within their partner. Their partner's not actually able to respond to anything because there's no, there's no spark. You think of the spark as like the presence. The deeper your presence, the more like phew, you light, you light the, the flame of that, that feminine flame that's in your partner. So that's what I see, man. I, was like, I, I speak to a man. I coach a lot of men and I just go take full ownership of it. You take ownership, take responsibility for the attraction, the intimacy, the love, the connection, the sex, all of it. You take ownership of all of it because you're the initiator. You know, you bring that spark. And once you wake that flame up in your partner, she'll pour back into you like, like nothing else. So yeah, that, that's my understanding of it. You talk a lot about the center and that, that center being true to you and true to your nature be it your creativity, be it your, your drive, be it the, the things about you that make you special. But what are the things that pull you off center? And what are, you, what are the things that you see that pull your clients off center? Mm. For me personally, the things that pull me off center is the tendency to want to avoid or look to the future for something that I don't want to feel now. Like meaning if there's something that I'm, I'm not like, say, say I woke up and I didn't sleep very well, then I might be like, yeah, well, maybe I need to have an ice bath. Maybe I need to have a coffee. Maybe I need to have a workout. Well, no, no, you just didn't sleep very well. You need to just rest and just relax. <laughs> <laughs> or, Hey, I've just had a long work day. I'm exhausted. I'm exhausted. Uh, I, I, I'm going to go out and, you know, if I can do this really intense class or you know what I mean? Look to the future. I'm looking external to change how I'm currently feeling because I'm not okay with this feeling of, dissatisfaction or unease that's going on inside of my body. And it happens very subtly, Tim, it's such a, a subtle um, conditioning or form of escapism. And it can be disguised in healthy habits, right? As, as I'm alluding to, but you've got the obvious unhealthy habits of like drinking, smoking, what, social media, all of all the things, but all of it, all of it is coming from of just an, a, a not, an unwillingness to just be with this current experience. And for me, I'm like, I'm a high achiever, right? I'm always like, I want to achieve. I want to go out and achieve. But if the achievement is coming from a place of, I need to get something, I, I need to achieve this thing, the followers, the money, whatever. If it's coming from, I need to get it. It's actually a form of escapism from myself. I'm trying to look external for something that's already down there, which is peace, love, joy, connection, fulfillment. So 
what I see in me is also what I see in my clients. So when I'm, when I'm coaching my clients, I'm, I'm looking at how much time do you have in your day where you just, you just sit and be, you just stop, you just slow down, just relax. And that's so challenging for high achievers, bro, because when you slow down, all the shit comes up that you've been avoiding. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's where all the, that's the gold mine. Underneath that is all the juice, all the magic. When you look at this, this, this gold mine, like how does that present and when does that present? Because when I stop, the, the, first, the first thing that I thought you were going to say is like, when you stop, a wave of guilt comes. I'm sure like many people listening to this will, will, will know what they mean because I definitely feel like if I stop, I start to feel guilty. My mind goes to Tim. You are someone that works every day. You work every day. You are building a company. You're building a product that's going to change so many people's lives. They're counting on you. You need to show up. There's more things that we can do. We can do things better. And you haven't done your reels. You've got to get those out. You've got to try and uh, hit back up the editor. Has he done this? Have we proofed the content good enough? Is there going to be any spelling mistakes? Like the, the, when I stop, those thoughts come. And then if I'm not doing those things, a wave of guilt comes. That's me as a business owner. I'm sure people are listening to this that are parents that are probably thinking like, I could be making the kids better food or doing something with my, with my children or uh, I should be looking after the house, working on the business. So the first wave is guilt. When, when do we get the gold? Like, how, <laughs> what's the process of pulling that out? <laughs> well, then you, you nailed it, man, because there's, there's, there's the emotion, there's the feeling. But then there's the story about the feeling, which is like, I feel the guilt and then the guilt triggers all these thoughts around how I'm not doing enough, I need to get more, so many things are gonna get done. People are relying on me, blah, 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 right? And what, what, I'm, what I sense or what I invite people to look at, what I'm always looking at is what's underneath the guilt. Oh, yeah, it's fear. Like, it's fear what happens, what, what, there you go. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say, what happens if you feel the guilt? What happens then? you just nailed it. It was like a horrible feeling of failure. That's what that, it's like the feeling of, I feel, I feel it in my body right now. It's like tingling feelings of, of fear of failure. I think. Beautiful, beautiful. Let, let's just be with that feeling for a moment because is that a familiar feeling for you? It's not really. No, I don't. I don't stop long enough. To even, <laughs> this is my feelings of, of going right. Like when you get that tingling feeling of failure, that's when you're like, oh, God, now I need to move to make that to make that go away. But I think you. if you if I was to sit with that deeper underneath that is 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 a fear of letting people down and a fear of not not being where we could be if i was continually pushing hmm. got you and and what were to happen if you were to let people down and if you were to fail <laughs> this is great because in my mind that goes to like a shortcut where there's like a brick wall that comes up it's just like that will not happen mm -hmm. <laughs> which is a protection the... layer which is beautiful right it's the first layer of protection yeah. is like we are not going there. That will not happen. Yeah. Both protection. Yeah. And that's the, 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 dri the driven high achiever, right? Operates from that layer. But if you just inquire deeper, what happens if I fail? What happens if I let people down? Yeah. In under that layer for me, it would be, it's, I mean, if, I think under that layer for me, I, all I can feel is like uh, that I've never even peered into that. So it's like looking into a black hole. Like all I can see is like the abyss underneath that. It, this isn't even something that I will let myself think of. So when you're saying like what happens if we look into that, it's almost like I imagine a lid coming off and me looking into it. And even though the container is like small like this, it's like you open it up and then inside that is just like a black whole of expanse of nothingness because it feels like you would fall in that forever and that that's the feeling <laughs> that i get and, and you'll be stuck in it forever 
and and now my logical brain is like no of course not we would find mm -hmm. another way we would find another way to survive and we'd we'd grow and that is i've never thought of that before i've never ever thought if i go into that hole that something good could be could actually come out of that at all well the truth is man that the black hole is the gold mine the black hole is where everything that we want exists. And I'll speak for myself. What I learned the black hole was, was this feeling of shame. Mm. This feeling of shame is behind the fear of failure, the fear of letting people down. Now the feeling of shame, and you might be able to relate to this as well is a familiar feeling because it's something we felt growing up as kids. Maybe our dad told us off, said, fuck, you know, what are you doing? Like we got, we got told off for not achieving, for not um, showing up how he wanted us to show up. Maybe we got conditional love growing up. Like when we did well, we got love, but when we didn't, we got scolded. So there's this buried shame down there that we wear this mask of saying, I'm never, I'm never going to feel this again. I'm going to make sure I'm achieving all the time. So I never have to feel this shame because there's this belief attached to the shame. So the shame is an emotion and there's this belief about who we are that's attached to the shame. And that belief is like, oh, I'm not worthy. I'm not, I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough to receive love. So we're out here trying to prove our worthiness by like achieve, achieve, achieve. But if it's coming from that place of fear, we will be achieving our whole life, chasing our whole life and we'll never get the goal. Because the gold can't come from outside of us. It comes when we go into the void. Is this, is this making sense? Yeah, it's making a hundred percent sense. And, and you see that so often. And I'm sure you see that. I know that I see that. I'm sure our listeners see this, where you see people who are so successful. I, I, I see this with, with founders all the time, right? I'm in the founder community. And you see people that have had it juicy exit they've built a company they've sold the company and you're like oh my goodness they must be they've done it this is it this is what we're all chasing they've, yeah. they've, they've got to the pot of gold and then you ask them you're like so what's it like on the other side like you're rich you 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 built something you scaled it you sold it and they're like i'm not doing well man yeah. <laughs> it's true man yeah <laughs> and and it's and it's because I think you're right deep and deep down I believe that whenever they say that to all the other people they're like listen it's it's not what you think it is and everyone's like no 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 it will be different for me <laughs> <laughs> yeah bro the mind is a sneaky little thing bro the, the mind is <sighs> honestly the the mind is really just designed to keep us safe and alive and it's just scanning for like, is this going to keep me safe? Am I going to be safe? And it looks at money as this illusion of safety. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm sure you, we've all experienced this where you've come into a lot of money or you've got the client, the business is, is going well and the money hits the bank account and you're like, oh, you get like a temporary feeling of safety. And then before you know it, you're back out there thinking that it's not enough. <laughs> yeah. So it's a complete veil money can't give you anything there is there is no safety attached to money because the feeling we're, we're after it, it comes from within it, it has to be generated for it to be sustainable it has to be accessed from within which is and from the, the access point is this deep place of going into the void and just diving into the void head first and going i i, I surrender i let go I'm going to love all the shit that comes up in this void. And when you confront that, man, that's when it's like, boof, you've, you've accessed something that nothing out there can really touch you. Nothing out there can really influence you that much because you know who you are deep down. How do we bring this into relationships? It's, it's really everything. It's everything because how can you really connect with someone deeply if you haven't connected with yourself deeply in that way? 
like you can still relate with someone, but it's going to be like at this level when really you can go, you can go much deeper. Like you can be playing in the, in the depths. And in my opinion, with my relationship, that's, that's where all the magic is, bro. That's where it's like, you, you just, there's still having as much sex with my partner as I did when I first met her. We're still just as attracted to each other when we first met. Like that's just what everyone wants. But the only way you can have it is if like you're, you're, you're just constantly moving through all the layers of fear that, that just come up because every layer of fear is a layer that's blocking you from connecting with other people. Mm-hmm. And so for men, it's the heart. It's like when our hearts closed, like we, we can't, we can't take in that, that feminine love. We've got all this fear that's, clo- that's, that's clogging the clock on the pipes, you know? And how can we unclog some of this with our partners? Like what are the practices that we can do practically? Got a couple listening to this. They're driving onto their date. What are some tools and tips that we can give them for them to begin this work right now? Because it feels uncomfortable. It felt uncomfortable for me talking, thinking about looking behind the wall, opening the lid, looking in, in the void, having shared that with you. Now I'm feeling like, Oh, I'm feeling a little bit lighter, a little bit more open. Like what are some of the things that we can give to, to couples as well? Yeah. And it's courageous, man. Thank, thank you for, for going there. Like that says so much about you because it's, it's not easy, especially as a, as another man to have these conversations. That's, it takes fucking courage that unfortunately a lot of people would rather just drink, drink alcohol or just watch Netflix and just like, fuck it. I don't want to go there. So that's the first step is like, be willing to go there with your partner be willing to say, Hey, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm feeling something here. I'm feeling something and I'm not okay with it. It's not sitting right with me. I'm feeling this resentment towards you. And, and, and it's been around for a while and, and I want to let go of it. And I'm feeling I just feel angry. And as men, like just owning, it's the first thing, being able to like label it, right? First, first thing, like what, what is that feeling? Like, really? What is it? Like put a word to it. Are you sad? Are you angry? Are you resentful? Are you hurt? And as soon as you start to like speak, you notice how as soon as you express something, you, you lighten the load. You, you, and when you express it with another person, it, it brings connection. That's intimacy. It's the ability to connect on an emotional level. But if you can't connect with your own emotions, you don't know what you're feeling. How can you have a, a conversation? How, how are you going to express to your partner what's actually going on? So I'd say it starts with like, just getting intimate with yourself and go like, okay, what's actually hap- what, what am I feeling right now? What's, what's present in my being? Then go to your partner and be like, Hey, you know what? I, I tried this thing. I, I just sat with my feelings for a little bit. I noticed I'm feeling this anger. I don't know where it's coming from. If you, is there anything that you're feeling that maybe you want to talk, talk through with me? Just a simple dialogue, man. I feel like goes a long way that it's amazing how many people don't do it. Having a partner that's open to this is so important, isn't it? Like you could imagine if you'd have said that to someone and, and you'd have got shut down and they'd have been like, what are you talking about? Um, hmm. Like they, 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 re- they react with, with scorn, mockery. I don't have time for this. Um, oh, not this again. Why are, you do- why are you doing this? Think about the myriad of ways that you could be yeah. shut down so important to have a partner that can hold space and and listen um and i think do you think it's fair to say that women are not as used to men coming to them with this kind of thing or do you think that actually women are much better at this because they're more emotional have more emotional backgrounds and are are better with their words Yes and no. I feel like there are a lot of men who are very sensitive. Like for me, I'll say I'm a very sensitive man. I feel deeply. Um, and my partner almost isn't as, as emotional as me. And, and that's okay. Right? Me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of men that I, I, I work with and cross paths with who are man, we're, we're deep feelers. We're, we're sensitive beings. And sometimes, you know, the, the woman can be so without, without realizing, without giving a man respect can, can really make a man want to shut down. And the, the two love languages are love and respect. There's a great book on that 
I can't remember the name of the author, but men just want respect and, and women want love, mm-hmm. right? And when we can understand that language, it's, you can go into an encounter or a connection with your partner and just say like, knowing that my partner, my, my, my woman, she, she really wants me to express my love to her in, in many different ways. But ultimately I just want unconditional respect from her. You know, respect me unconditionally around what I'm going through. And there's nuance to that. But you're right in the holding space part. I feel like whoever's listening to this, you know, if, 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 if you're listening to this, you're the one. You're the one that's gonna have to lead this. It could be a man, it could be a woman. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. But if you're the one listening to this content, you're the one that's more sensitive. You're the one that's more tuned into this, this world and this work. So it's my belief system that the one who's more conscious, the one who has a more regulated nervous system should lead in these situations. It's, it doesn't matter if, it, if it's the man or woman, personally. I hope that makes sense. I love that. And I think as well is that because by leading, you're starting to create this new culture in your relationship of listening and holding space. And holding space means, for anyone that's listening to this podcast, haven't heard it before, really it means giving the room to your partner's feelings, thoughts, just like how Jordan did for me, asking continuing to dig into why what's behind that how does that make you feel if you look past that what's there and help them act as a guide for them to go deeper and and by doing that together if you can do that together you're not having a a a surface level conversation you are having like a deep a deep amazing conversation with your partner that is really quite rare in in modern relationships i feel like for sure, man. And I, and I almost feel like you don't need to, you know, lead them into their trauma and be like, Oh, what's behind the fear of failure? Like you, you're afraid that you're not worthy of love. <laughs> you can just start with just by mirroring back to them. Okay. Like this is what I'm hearing. You know, that's a really good starting point when someone's having a communication, just mirror back to them. Oh man. So okay, I'm hearing that you're, you're afraid. Right. And then what you can do is start to empathize with that and, and understand, okay, fuck no shit. Like I can understand why you're thinking like that. Or I can understand why you're, you're feeling like that. It, it helps the other person to feel seen. That's what we all want, man, at the end of the day. We just want to be seen and understood by fellow human beings, but more importantly, for the people that we love. So for men, holy shit, this is, this is the juice right here. If you can just see and understand your woman, she's going to start to feel safe around you and phew, it will just like, it will just unravel. You don't even have to do anything. Just hold that space of safety and you'll support her it, it, like in a way that maybe she's never been supported before. Yeah, that's incredible. I really like this. I think it's a, it's such a, it's such a powerful, such a powerful practice to put into your relationship. It can be tricky though, when you've got all of the things happening, you've got, you've got kids, you've got their schedules, you're both so busy. How do you recommend that couples foster this time? Mm-hmm. I mean, I feel like it's a, it, it, it must be created. There's no, uh, it doesn't matter how busy we are. Like this is just a non-negotiable time uh, to be like, Hey, every Wednesday, cool, we sit down and like, we have a check in with each other. What's, what's going on? Anything that needs to be expressed, anything that's on your heart that you want to talk about. And Ultimately, we should always be having these, this time with ourselves, having this constant checking in with ourselves so that we have the emotional capacity to be, then be able to, to take that into our relationships and, and be able to see what's going on with our partners. But man, at the end of the day, like if you're not making time, if we're not making time for ourselves, then how can we expect, expect to be there for the people that we love, especially like kids, they got kids, like your kids need, need you to bring your presence and your attentiveness and your empathy to them. But by thinking that you don't have time to give that to yourself, you're also saying, I don't have time to give it to you. Your kids are also watching, learning and modeling your relationship. If you can use these super advanced relationship techniques that are backed up by relationship research, relationship science, you bring these successful techniques to create an incredible relationship. Your kids are going to model that and bring that forward into their relationships, creating a new generation of people that are going to create incredible long lasting relationships too. Bang. That's it, man. Yeah. They're just mirroring and absorbing everything, but how you're showing up and man, there's just no better way to impart like 
this the essence of this onto your kids by just living it just be be the change you want to see how how do you currently do this in your relationship jordan i've shared on this podcast multiple times and i'm sure the audience are sick of hearing of me and my girlfriend's <laughs> routines but I, I i really want to hear um how how you do this as well how i do the kind of like check-ins how do you do yeah how do you do a check-in or a deep conversation and then I want to move into how do you work through conflict as well? Or mm-hmm. well, maybe it'd be helpful if I just give an example of something that's happened recently and that will help you yeah, see what, how I approached it. But um, the other week, I think last week, that uh, there was a situation that happened with my partner where she had hurt her, hurt her leg on the scooter. She burnt her, her leg getting off the scooter. And uh, I, without realizing, um, didn't really show a lot of um, sympathy to, towards her. And what ended up happening was uh, she like took care of herself. She like patched it up herself, went and got the bandaid herself. And um, she ended up opening up to me and, and saying that she didn't feel supported from me. She didn't feel like I was showing enough nurturance and care towards her. And, it, and she was really upset by that, really upset by that. And she was, she almost, and she said to me, this has been a pattern. I was like, huh, okay, shit. And the one person in my life that I want to make sure that I'm attentive and taken care of is my, is my girlfriend for sure. But as we unraveled it, I started to understand, oh, right. I can understand why you feel like that because growing up, her dad was so attentive, so nurturing. Her friends are so nurturing. I never had that, bro. My dad was like, fucking get up, get on with it. No, no one around me was like nurturing to me in terms of like, if I hurt myself, like obviously if it was severe, but little things like get on with it, you'll be right. So I had this blind spot. I had this complete blind spot in my awareness of what she needed in those moments right and 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 through dialogue and conversation i was like oh shit hey look i i really want to make more of an effort in this and and i'm i'm sorry that i I couldn't see that and what i'm what i'm seeing or what i'm understanding is you just want some more care you just want some more support and love during these times uh how can i how, how can i best give that to you like what are some ways that i can support you in that and it just came down to me having awareness around it and it was a, a, a big moment because now I'm like, oh, cool. Like now I'm, I'm, I'm aware of it. I can see it. And little things like that, that will show up in relationships because it's just growing up. I, was, I had a different upbringing. She had a different upbringing. So there's going to be these blind spots that will reveal themselves in, in our relationships as triggers. If our partner triggers us by something they're doing or not doing, it's one of the ways in which we're unconsciously speaking an unmet emotional need from our childhood. And the trigger then turns into an opportunity to, to, to flip it, which is like, like, I was triggered by her getting so angry. I was like, why are you getting so angry about this? It's like, not a big deal. You're, you're good. But there was an unmet emotional need there for me, which was like, I wanted nurturance. I'm not very nurturing to myself. I'm very hard on myself. So then, boom, how can I expect to be nurturing for her if I'm not even giving that nurturance to myself? So it was a complete mirror. I was like, holy shit. Wow. I just needed that from my dad. I needed some like, hey man, you're all good. I got you. I got you. We're gonna get through this. Gift. There, there's an amazing book, and I'm I'm hoping it's right there. It's called Getting the Love That You Want. And there's a story in this in which they talk about how couples can help each other heal. There's this idea out there that's like you should turn up to your relationship with a, all of your work done, and that you don't need, that you need to be like perfect to be in a relationship. While it's good to do some work beforehand, it's okay to shop relationship with some needs and it's okay for your partner to help heal those needs. And in yeah. this book, the author talks about this thing that he went through and that unfortunately his, his parents passed away in a, in a car crash and he moved in with his aunt and every day his aunt would t- clean up his room and it was her way of showing love. So he'd come, he, every, he just had this really clear memory of uh, coming home and the bed being made in like I think like almost like a military style like precision like a beautiful bed being made in his room every day and it was his aunt's way of saying like I'm here for you we love you we've got this and mm. he would wake up before his wife and then he'd come back in uh, and see that the, the bed was kind of just like in a disarray his wife had no attachment to making the bed after she got up right and <laughs> For him, it was like an attack on his safety. And it was only after really going really, really deep. And it, they said it, he, this was a memory that he'd forgotten about. It was so long ago. 
Yeah. And when he understood and was like, hey, I'm really sorry to ask this. Well, I don't think he said it like that. He just said, I have a need in which like our bed is always made. And I really want you to make it because that for me was a way in which I was showed love in the most vulnerable time in my life. And it just is an amazing thing for me. He's like, I, I recognize that this is not like a, a normal ask, but this is a healing thing for me. And his his wife was like, oh, I had no idea that all of this was attached to it. Of course, like, it's not a big deal for me. It takes two minutes. I'll make the bed. And that was like a deal that they had that was sort of like a relationship deal. And it's really interesting looking at this in which it's okay to ask for things from your partner. It's okay, it's okay to ask for things from your partner as long as it's somewhat reasonable that are healing for you as well. Dude, thank you for sharing that. It's a beautiful share. And hundred percent, like the, the, and I've read that book as well. And the, the main thing that I understood and took from that, which was the relationship is there to help you. It's there to show you all the ways in which you're not whole, you're not free. You still have fear. You still have unmet needs from your childhood. The relationship is the, is the best mirror and opportunity for you to rediscover that sense of wholeness from yourself because we just had so many moments growing up where we needed something we didn't get it and it's just it's just a part of life our parents can't be perfect so and, and you're right like it's it's so okay to have a, a need and a request and when you work through the emotional need yourself and give yourself that love and wholeness then you can be like hey like would you be willing to do this for me this would mean so much for you for me and most of the time your partner's gonna be like of course fuck yeah uh, I got you. I'm like, I'm on your team, you know? It, it showed up in my relationship for the first time when I discovered that my girlfriend hates cutting up fruit. I don't know exactly why we haven't done the deep. We haven't done the deep work. If there is one, but she's just like, <laughs> I, I love, I love eating fruit, but I freaking hate cutting it up. And I was like, amazing. I've, I've got something. This can be like a win. This can be a relationship win. I'm like, girl, I've got you. You don't have to worry about cutting up a watermelon as long as we're together. I will buy them. I will cut them up. I do not, I do not mind cutting up your watermelons at all. <laughs> and, and it's just, it's just become like a little love language that we have, in which like every time we go to the grocery store, <laughs> and bless her, I'll like put a big watermelon in, put in a melon, and then she'll look at me and be like, oh, are you gonna? And I was like, yeah. Of course I'm going to cut them up. And then I'll just text her and be like, oh, oh, babe, like there's like a ton of watermelon and fruit. You need to go and eat it all. And, it, and, it, and it's just become like a very um, fun couples thing that thing that we do that I think builds like these little bits of, of trust, you know? 100%. 100%. And then the more you, the more time and the longer you're with your partner, the more you start to understand like what, what, what they need, what they appreciate what they love, how you can surprise them. And it's just, it grows over time, right? As, as I'm sure you're, you're noticing. As long as you're, as long as you're updating your love maps, right? Because yes, I, I mean, look, 43 minutes into it, as I've, as me and Jordan are diving into this, we're doing this, we're talking about this emotional stuff. We're talking about this relationship work stuff. But the truth of the matter is, is that Apart from the people listening to this podcast, of course, a lot of people out there aren't constantly trying to push, deepen, and discover. This is something that's like really lacking because actually all of those hormones, those neurotransmitters that are firing, that are lighting up like a Christmas tree in the first few years of your relationship, there's a heartbreaking study that showed that actually that was the time in which couples knew each other the best and felt the most cared for by their partner. Whereas the longer the relationship went on, sometimes people actually knew less about one another because we changed so much. So like Interesting. Making, sure that, making sure that you're continually doing this research and having these conversations and creating this space to like rediscover your partner as well. I mean, this is why I think your story is so interesting, Jordan, because you've done, you and your partner have done so much changing and shifting in your relationships from the locations that you've lived in the work that you've done and your growth as individuals it's like a full this 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 constant evolution in your in your in your life and this is why it's so interesting to see how you guys are creating these patterns even while you're moving changing shifting careers yeah thank you man i appreciate that and you 
it's a really interesting share and statistic because it's true. It's interesting how that that unconscious pattern can happen. We can be around someone for for, for so 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 much of time, but, but then not have the open dialogue to really understand them. That that really upsets me. It's disappointing that that that's a fact, you know. Uh, but I, I think it comes back to, to what I was saying before, which is like, if once you discover and know your path and know like what it is that you're here to bring to the world and you follow that path and you have a partner who you're resonating with, you have the spark and the charge and you're working together, and you're living together and it's evolving together and you just keep following it step by step, then beautiful, it works. But man, who knows? There might be a point in my journey where like the relationship cool, we go in different directions. And if that has to happen, it, it so be it. I'm not attached to the idea that I need to be with her for the rest of my life. And I think that's a huge thing for so many people. And it, understandably, hey, once you get past your 30s, like mid to late 30s, especially for the woman, there's this biological thing of like, fuck, I better find someone now. Otherwise, I'm not going to be able to create babies. It's just built into the biology. Then there's this attachment that can sometimes creep in. It's like, I need to find someone well, okay, that I would address that. What's the fear underneath that? You know, because again, if we're coming from fear, that's what's blocking the real love and intimacy. You know what I mean? Yeah, if, so what you're saying is like, if you're getting into an age category, you want to have a family, you have a hard deadline or a hardish deadline um, that, that starts to loom up. That, that deadline creates a burning platform for time, which creates a a lot of pressure on you to to settle down and be with quote unquote the one and 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 that pushes you to be you're you're coming to everything from a place of of fear which i think probably prospective partners if you're single might feel nailed it completely nailed it and the more you have relinquished fear from the cells of your body the more you are a safe space to attract authentic love, you, the more you're gonna attract someone who is authentically connected to who they are. And that's what we all want. Like we want that soul connection. We don't want this surface level bullshit. And like, okay, maybe you do, if you do, like, oh, go, go to the bar and fucking drink a few cocktails and chat the people around. If you want a soul connection, like meet your soul, connect with your soul, love your soul, and then just live your life. And they'll show up. Like you don't go looking for it. They show up. You spoke about finding the spark and putting the spark back into into a relationship. What are some of the ways if people feel like that spark is waning or it's getting lost? What are some of the ways that you teach couples to to get it back? Hmm. I mean, it comes back to the, the polarity part, right? It comes back to the mm. understanding what is, your, what is your natural essence? Where do you reside in your being? Right? Like where, where does that natural like, like spark reside in you? And if you're working a job that you hate and you're hanging out with people you don't enjoy and then you drink it on the weekends to suppress the shitty feeling, then you can guarantee you've, you've, you've gone off track with what's like what what your what your heart is trying to express in the world, and of course the polarity is going to fade in your relationship because you're fading, you're withering away. So to come back online, you know, for your relationship is you have to give yourself that time and space to naturally recalibrate. Uh, like for me, for example, it's like hey, go go sit on a beach all day, just get off your phone and just allow nature to just bring you back, or go on a three day juice cleanse. I did that a few weeks ago, and poof, I just my body just went shoop, clinked back in. I was like, whoa, I'm like, I just feel alive again. And then you can bring that to your relationship. And it's like your partner's responding to that, especially with the women. Like, uh, the frequency, the literal frequency of, of, a, of your gaze, when you gaze into your partner's eyes, that depth of presence that you have creates a frequency that literally awakens them. Oof, like it awakens this like love in them because you're coming from a place of unconditional love for yourself. It, it's, it is, there's, 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 it's an electromagnetic shift that happens um, that it has to come back to the, to the yourself always, always comes back to the individual. 
we had Dr. Jessica Higgins on our, on our podcast who spoke about neuroception. And she spoke about the fact that you can pick up on these, on this energy that your partner's admitting. So I think that's, it's, it's really cool as well that you talk about people taking that responsibility for like, hey, where's the spark in my relationship? No. Where's the spark in you? What, what about yeah. your spark? Like, let's, let's see that spark start shining and then watch that respond back in your partner. What a powerful message that is. Big and time. I think it takes people away from being like, having this like negative bias with like, maybe my partner doesn't do this, my partner doesn't do that. Let's start building yourself back up shining and like that will bring things back 100 percent, dude yeah that's it if any if if that's the one thing people take from this boom that's that's the shift take responsibility so look, jordan this has been a fantastic conversation where can people find more about you and where can they discover more Tim, I thoroughly enjoyed this, man. You're, you're a legend and I really appreciate the work that you're, you're doing. It's just, this is so important to just bring these conversations and just genuinely want to help people improve their relationships because everyone deserves it, man. Everyone deserves to just like have love and fun and freedom and joy. And yeah, I really hope that this is a, whoever's listening got something from this and I, I appreciate you having me on. Uh, Jordan Canlish 01 on Instagram and TikTok. That's uh, my main platforms. Uh, Facebook as well. YouTube, Jordan Canlish, um, putting out a lot more podcasts myself, longer form content. Uh, like you said, I've got a relationship workshop happening on uh, the 15th of June. Don't know when this will go live, but if you want to catch the replay of it, if you don't hear it in time, just message me on Instagram. I'm sure I'll be able to get it to you. And uh, yeah, man, that's they're the main places. Uh, currently in Tulum, I'll be in uh, Toronto, uh, where you are in July, hosting a men's retreat out there on, at the end of July. Got about four spots left for that. So if there's a man listening and they want to come out and connect in person and do this work, then there will be a, there will be some spaces available. Incredible. I was going to ask you what is happening for the rest of your year, but you're going to be out in Toronto in July. I really hope that we can connect in person then, Jordan. It would Me be too. awesome to meet you IRL. Final question. Who should we get on the Coupley Relationship Podcast next any recommendations <laughs> yes yeah I hope, I hope we connect as well man when i'm in when i'm in toronto um my one of my mentors one of my teachers one of my guides uh chris bale uh someone who I spent a lot of time learning from being with on his on, on getting coaching from him uh he's the man bro if you want to go to another level of depth in terms of the energetics and the polarity He's the man because I'm operating at a certain level, but he's accessed a, a true level of depth of, of connection with, with this work that I've not come across. So uh, check him out. I highly recommend getting him on here. Amazing. And we will get this podcast out so that you can sign up to Jordan's session. The link will be below. Please, guys, make sure you do. You can see what an awesome guy he is. It's definitely worth the investment. And... We owe it to ourselves and our relationships to continually invest. It's so, so important we do. Jordan, you're a legend. What a pleasure it's been. Thank you so much for coming and sharing your time and your wisdom with us. Thanks, Tim. You're a legend, man. Thanks, guys. Thanks for tuning in.